Welcome to Capsule RN, where nursing school just got easier. Meet Bob, a 72-year-old patient brought to the hospital for blurry vision, nausea, and headache. The emergency room staff takes Bob's vital signs and discovers a blood pressure of 202 over 110. The nurse immediately notifies the doctor and follows his orders. What are possible complications of Bob's high blood pressure if not treated immediately? Is it A, kidney damage, B, aneurysm, C, stroke, or D, all of the above? To answer this question correctly, we first need to understand what is blood pressure and how does it affect the body? To understand blood pressure, we need to recall some things you probably already know, but it's about the circulatory system. Oxygen-rich blood exits the heart and enters the blood vessels to carry oxygen to the rest of the body. The pressure this flow of blood exerts on the walls of arteries is what is called blood pressure. Now, there are two things that determine blood pressure. One is the amount of blood pumped out of the heart, and two is the diameter of the blood vessels. Let's talk about each of these. First, the amount of blood pumped out by the heart. What we mean by this is best understood by looking at two scenarios. In scenario A, the heart is pumping out less blood, so there's less blood in the vessels as well. Therefore, there's less pressure on the walls of the arteries, and because of this, the blood pressure number is going to be lower. In scenario B, however, the heart is pumping out a lot of blood, which fills the blood vessel space up more, causing the pressure on the artery walls to increase. If the blood pressure were taken in this scenario, it would be higher. The second thing that determines blood pressure is the diameter of the blood vessels themselves. If there's plaque buildup or a narrowing of the arteries because of poor health or lifestyle choices, the blood has less space in which to travel within the vessel. Less space means more force on the walls of those arteries, and therefore the blood pressure is going to be higher. Let's go back to the basics. Blood pressure is written as two numbers. One number on top called the systolic blood pressure, and one number on the bottom called the diastolic blood pressure. What do these two numbers actually mean, though? Systolic blood pressure is the maximum amount of pressure in the artery that occurs when the heart is beating or pumping. In other words, when the heart is in the process of actually pushing out blood into the rest of the circulatory system. And remember, if there is more blood being pumped out by the heart, it fills up the vessels so they are fuller and experience higher pressure. The diastolic blood pressure, on the other hand, is the minimum amount of pressure in the artery that occurs when the heart is resting, or in other words, between heart beats. There is less blood flow and pressure in the vessels at this phase since the heart isn't actively pushing blood into the arteries when it is resting. Practically speaking then, the diastolic blood pressure number will be lower than the systolic blood pressure number since there is less pressure in the diastolic or resting phase than in the systolic or pumping phase within those artery walls. Next, we're going to talk about blood pressure categories because as nurses, we need to mentally know how to categorize the blood pressure readings we take on our patients. There are two things I wanted to mention before talking about these blood pressure categories. And the first is that we're going to be talking about adult patient, not pediatric patient, normals and abnormals. So just make a note of that. And then secondly, I want to note that we're going to be focusing on systolic or top numbers for these blood pressure readings, not so much the diastolic readings. I've just found that it's easier to hang your hat on if we just talk about the systolic. First off, let's start with this. What blood pressure number is too low for an adult patient? If you set a systolic blood pressure of less than 90, you are correct. Hypotension is a systolic blood pressure of less than 90. However, we don't want to wait till our patient is 90 or less on the systolic before we're starting to think about this. We want to look at their trends and see if they're trending down and are getting closer to you know, 100 and then inching even lower than that. We want to take note of that and be proactive and notify the doctor and see what we can do about those things ahead of time rather than waiting till it's later in the process. The next blood pressure category after hypotension is a normal blood pressure range, which is less than 120 over 80. That is a number that it's helpful to memorize the systolic and diastolic just to be able to hang your hat on and orient every other blood pressure around. Once the systolic blood pressure has reached 120 or above, however, we do now call that elevated blood pressure. 
That's not something to panic about, but it is something to note. And a primary care provider is going to be working with the patient to help educate them on lifestyle changes, diet changes, things like that, that will help them bring their blood pressure back down to normal range. Now, the next two categories are stage one and stage two hypertension. Hypertension is high blood pressure. Hypertension has an acronym of HTN. And in 2017, new guidelines were released that said that high blood pressure starts at 130 and above. This is a change because it used to be higher before they called it high blood pressure. So stage one and stage two hypertension are something that a primary care provider very well might be treating with medication, as well as continuing to encourage lifestyle changes like diet changes, exercise routines, things of that nature. The last category is hypertensive crisis, which is when a systolic blood pressure is greater than 180. And this is an emergency situation in which a doctor needs to know if a blood pressure is 180 or above, or really if you see a trend where it's 160s, 170s, getting up there, you should go ahead and notify the doctor to make sure they realize that it is getting to that point where they need to give orders so that you can act in the best interest of your patient to help bring down that high blood pressure to a more manageable number. Next, we're going to talk about some do's and don'ts of taking a blood pressure because if you don't do it correctly, then you might not have an accurate number and your results will be skewed. The first do when taking a blood pressure is do measure the blood pressure after a patient has rested five minutes or so. Movement increases blood pressure. So if you take a blood pressure immediately after a patient has walked or come into a clinic, then their blood pressure is going to be higher than their normal and you need to give it time to get back to their baseline. The second do is do have a patient sit or lie with legs uncrossed. Don't have them standing up, but when they're sitting or lying down, make sure their legs are not crossed because if they cross their legs, it does increase blood pressure. Third, do make sure the patient is not talking. Talking as well increases blood pressure. Fourth, do use the proper cuff size. And this is very important. Too small of a cuff will cause a higher blood pressure reading than is really true. And too big of a cuff will cause a lower blood pressure reading than is really true. So it's very important to use the right cuff for each patient. Lastly, do elevate the patient's arm to heart level. Remember that blood pressure changes depending on how much blood is in the vessel. If the arm is lifted higher than the heart or hung lower than the heart, the blood volume changes due to gravity and that can affect the accuracy of the blood pressure number. Moving on to things that you do not want to do when taking a blood pressure. We do not want to take a blood pressure on an extremity with an IV, shunt, mastectomy, blood clot, or graft. Taking a blood pressure on an extremity with one of these things can cause issues especially the shunt, mastectomy, blood clot, or graft. With the IV, it's just not best practice because the pressure from taking a blood pressure can blow the IV. But the other categories like shunts, mastectomies, blood clots, or grafts can really cause major issues if you take a blood pressure on that side. Next, we're going to talk about things that decrease blood pressure, and we'll talk about four of them. First are heart problems, and the two key heart problems that I want you to remember are bradycardia and heart attack. With bradycardia, the heart is not pumping very often, so there's less blood entering the circulatory system in a minute's time. And then with heart attack, the heart muscle is damaged, so it doesn't pump as much blood out because it's not as strong. So with both bradycardia and heart attack, there's going to be less blood entering the blood vessels. And as we know, less blood in the blood vessels means a decreased blood pressure. The next thing that can cause decreased blood pressure is hypovolemia. Hypo means low in this word. So low volume. In hypovolemia, the volume of blood in the circulatory system has decreased. And this could be for numerous reasons. It could be because of blood or fluid loss. Things that would cause blood or fluid loss would be things like hemorrhage, as in trauma or childbirth, dehydration, or a severe burn. The third thing that can decrease blood pressure is vasodilation. And this is when the blood vessel itself dilates or gets bigger, which decreases the pressure on the walls of the arteries. So vasodilation lowers blood pressure. And then the fourth thing is medications. Diuretics or fluid pills like furosemide and antihypertensive medications like lisinopril are designed to lower blood pressure purposely. So doctors will prescribe these medications if a patient has high blood pressure and they will decrease the blood pressure. There's one other thing that we need to discuss when talking about a decreased blood pressure, 
and that is orthostatic or postural hypotension. This is a significant drop in blood pressure that happens when a patient changes position, such as when they go from lying to sitting or sitting to standing. To rule out orthostatic hypotension, the doctor may order orthostatic vital signs to measure the blood pressure and heart rate when the patient is lying and then sitting and then standing. If there is a significant drop in the blood pressure or increase in the heart rate between these position changes, the diagnosis the doctor may make is orthostatic hypotension. What are signs and symptoms of low blood pressure? The signs and symptoms of low blood pressure may be dizziness, blurred vision, or fainting. And depending on the entire medical history of the patient, as well as the actual cause for their low blood pressure, the doctor will treat that differently. But in general, if there's a low blood pressure and there's not underlying conditions like heart or lung problems with fluid overload, then you can anticipate that a doctor will probably order the patient to push more PO fluids or fluids by mouth, or will order a fluid bolus through the IV if the blood pressure is low. There are also things that increase blood pressure that we need to be aware of. The first one is pain. If a patient has just come out of surgery or has had any sort of injury, if they are in pain, their blood pressure will be elevated. So giving them an ordered pain medication is very helpful for their own comfort, for sure, but that in turn also brings down their blood pressure. The second thing that can increase blood pressure is stress or worry. These two things will cause an elevated blood pressure. So if a patient comes into a doctor's office and has white coat syndrome, they are anxious and their blood pressure will be elevated. The third thing that can increase blood pressure is diet. Too much salt in the diet will increase the blood pressure. The fourth thing are lifestyle choices. So a lifestyle that leads to obesity or a lifestyle that involves smoking, those are things that will increase blood pressure. And the fifth thing that can increase blood pressure are decongestant medications. Common decongestants are oxymetazoline, also known as Afrin, and pseudoephedrine, also known as Sudafed. High blood pressure can have various signs and symptoms like blurred vision, nausea, headache, nosebleeds, chest pain, arrhythmias. However, The majority of patients with high blood pressure are asymptomatic, and that is why high blood pressure is often called the silent killer. Hypertension over time silently destroys organs inside the body like the kidneys, eyes, and heart. The intense pressure of hypertension can also cause weakness in major blood vessels so that a bulge occurs called an aneurysm. If an aneurysm ruptures, it can be deadly. If an aneurysm ruptures in the brain, it can lead to brain damage called a hemorrhagic stroke. Again, treatment for blood pressure issues will vary depending on the cause of the blood pressure problem and the full medical history of the patient, but we do want to anticipate for high blood pressure some possible treatments the doctor may order. So depending on what the issue is, the doctor may order pain medication, emptying the bladder because a full bladder can increase blood pressure, slowing fluids, limiting salt, or giving a diuretic or antihypertensive medication to bring the blood pressure down. In addition, if your patient asks you how they can lower their blood pressure naturally through their lifestyle, some things that you can suggest are exercise and weight loss, limiting their salt intake, limiting their alcohol intake, as well as their caffeine intake, quitting smoking, and getting adequate sleep and relaxation. So what about Bob? Remember him? What are possible complications of Bob's high blood pressure if not treated immediately? Is it A, kidney damage, B, aneurysm, C, stroke, or D, all of the above? If you said D, all of the above, you are correct. High blood pressure can have all of these effects and more. Thanks for being part of the Capsule RN community. If this video added value to your studies, please hit the like and subscribe buttons. We are excited about releasing more and more content in our continued pursuit of making nursing school easier. 